It's almost a hybrid, almost a CX-30, and it's almost gorgeous to look at. The Mazda MX-30 is many things, but is it also confusing Mazda's small SUV range just a little bit? Even the name is confusing to some. Is an MX for sports cars? MX actually stands for Motoring Experiment, and it's designed to overcome a challenge in the industry or for Mazda. The MX-5 made sports cars affordable and reliable, the MX-30 brings electrification to the Mazda brand. But this one is the petrol-powered G20e Astina. Does it have a place in Mazda's showroom? It's time to find out. First, the world said, give us small SUVs, and Mazda said, let there be CX-3. Then the world said, give us stylish SUV coupes, and Mazda said, let there be CX-30. Then the world said, give us electric cars, and Mazda is sort of getting there. Because if you look in here, that's an internal combustion engine. Instead of creating an entirely new EV, Mazda built a model based very heavily on the CX-30 platform and put an electric drivetrain in it but they also created a hybrid version, which is this. The system is a 24 volt starter motor and a small battery pack, which makes it a mild hybrid that Mazda calls M-Hybrid. We reckon most people probably wouldn't notice the difference between this and a regular petrol engine, because in practice, the main difference is a little bit of extra kick while you're driving, but we'll come to that later. The M-Hybrid MX-30 range has three variants, all with the same drivetrain, starting at $33,990 for the base Evolve and up to $49,990 for this top-spec Astina. This makes it a little bit more expensive than its CX-30 counterparts. Is it worth it though? Depends on what you want from your small SUV, so let's take a look. At the front of the MX-30, the design already departs a little bit from Mazda's other models. For example, these adaptive circular LEDs and the little shape beside them kind of remind me of an Alfa Romeo Giulietta's taillights. The lights themselves are quite sunk into the front of the car, where there's not all that much grille space, giving you more space to enjoy this Mazda Soul Red Crystal, which might just be my favourite colour on any new car. There are more lights down the plastic bumper here, which itself runs around the side of the car to be more plastic trim around the wheel arches and under the doors. Along the side, this might be a little bit too much plastic trim for me, but I have to wonder what it would look like without it. These 18-inch wheels are the same across the Mazda MX-30 range, and this one actually has a tri-colour option pack, which gives you grey along the pillars and a black roof. Down the back here, the roof line drops off pretty dramatically, which does affect the interior space, but we'll come to that a little bit later. And finally, up the back, we have this quite retro-styled Mazda badge, which appropriately says Mazda. When I was having this car shot during the week, the photographer pointed out that the taillights look a little bit like they're pulled off a Ferrari 488, and now I can't unsee it, although I do like the way they work with a little cluster in the back of the Mazda. The other thing you might have noticed back on the front is this little EV sticker on the plate here. That's not actually Mazda's decision, Vic Roads puts that on there as a warning in case there is a fire, just so that firefighters know there's batteries and electrical components in here that could be a safety issue. A little bit of an oddity of bureaucracy, but looks a little bit confusing on a petrol car. I also do want to show you what the sloped roof line does to the boot space compared to the CX-30. About 6 litres, Mazda claims, uh, 311 litres in here, measured VDA, which is sort of this space up to the separator here, uh, the CX-30 gets 317, but it also does get some extra space under the boot, which measures 340 litres. In here, that space is taken up by a spare wheel and part of the Bose speaker system. So not quite as convenient, but generally about the same. So, what Mazda calls its Kodo design language is pretty obvious on the MX-30. Mazda actually says this is an evolved version of Kodo, which is aimed at young, white-collar type couples. Personally, I quite like the design, and that might not be surprising given I'm a young, white-collar type person. I think there are a few elements on the car that might be a little bit divisive. For me, it's some of the plastic on the car, and I think it might look a bit better if it was just a little lower in its stance. Overall, a pretty interesting and distinctive design, and the interior is no different. I've had passengers in here tell me the interior reminds them a little bit of a BMW i3, and I can definitely see what they mean. Mazda's always been quite good at competing with the Europeans when it comes to interior design and quality, but the MX-30 seems to step it up just a little bit. Uh, for example, you've got this kind of floating panel in the middle here, and some storage below it. It's a little bit awkward to get to when you're actually driving, but otherwise it's quite good to have things out of the way. 
Down here is also where the USB plugs are for Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. Again, a little bit annoying to get to at first, but once it's plugged in, you've got a cable and it leads to wherever you want, it doesn't really matter. When you are using Android Auto or Apple CarPlay, it means you're bypassing Mazda's own infotainment system, which is pretty nice to use and relatively simple, but using a scroll wheel to access it feels a little outdated when most touchscreens are now up to scratch in terms of quick and easy to use functions. For music and podcasts, the MX-30 has a Bose 12 speaker system, which I think does a great job of producing sound to a decent quality. If you're an audiophile and you have your own preferences, you might find something to complain about, but I don't think most people will. One of my favorite things in the cabin is actually the climate control touchscreen. It's better than having all of your controls hidden in a menu in the infotainment system, but it's also always lit up and easy to see, so it makes it a little bit better than having a row of tiny little buttons. It's also where in the top spec of Stina, you can control both heated seats in the front and a heated steering wheel, plus there's physical buttons on the side to control the temperature of both halves of the car. Everything's always there and easy for you to see, but you can adjust the brightness or whether it's daytime or nighttime mode, depending on what suits your eyes. The other immediately obvious thing about the interior in the MX-30 is the materials. Sustainability was a big focus for Mazda with the MX-30. So you have materials like up here, this stuff that feels like cloth is actually recycled plastic. The other thing is that the leather on the seats is Maztex, which means it's not actually real leather. I know I've been ignoring one of the most obvious materials in the cabin, but I've been waiting to use it for a creative transition. It's the cork. I know it seems like an easily damaged or worn down material to put in a cabin, but I think in the low touch places, like on top of the cup holders where it is, is probably okay. The reason Mazda's used it is because a hundred years ago, Mazda used to manufacture cork. But not only did Mazda used to manufacture cork, this is the transition bit. Because Mazda also used to make a car with these. It was called the RX-8 and it had rear opening doors just like these. Mazda calls them freestyle doors, probably because calling them suicide doors is not a great look on the marketing material. For the MX-30, it's a point of difference that might convince some buyers who want to stand out. Unfortunately, in this case, standing out is a little bit more comfortable than sitting in. Unlike some other small SUV rear seats, these feel a little bit like an afterthought. I'm just under six foot and I'm sitting behind my own seating position and I don't feel like I have a ton of space. The sloping roof line has cut off some of my headroom. I feel like anyone taller than me would probably have a really uncomfortable time. And it doesn't feel like I've really got room to shift or adjust myself if I was maybe back here on a relatively long trip. The other thing about the back seat is that there's not much in terms of amenity. So it feels like the kind of place you probably wouldn't want to put a child for any extended amount of time. There's no USB ports for charging things like iPads. The cup holders in the doors are quite small and there's not much that's visually entertaining here either. The other thing is that I do have buttons where I can control the seat in front of me, which you can imagine a child deciding is the only thing that's enjoyable in here. If you disagree with me, there are ISOFIX points to put a child seat back here. The other thing that's a little bit frustrating about the rear seats here is that if you're in the front, you need to open your door and undo your seatbelt to let someone in or out. The seatbelts are actually mounted on the rear doors and they don't open unless the front doors are open. A little bit quirky and a little bit cute in theory, but probably in practicality, a little bit annoying. If you've driven a recent Mazda, nothing from the driver's seat should be a surprise. The steering is accurate and the weight is quite satisfying. The suspension's not too soft that it feels wafty, but it's firm enough that it does control itself over bumps and any time you might need to make a sharp turn. There aren't too many surprises when you're driving the MX-30, but that also kind of means it's not the most exciting car to drive. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing though, because something people have come to expect from Mazda is quite a nice plush and premium driving feel. One point of difference that the MX-30 does have going for it is the hybrid system. And like I said, most people probably couldn't tell it's there unless you told them, but if you're familiar with Mazda's engines, this does have a nice little extra kick. Having said all of that, I do have one criticism of driving the MX-30, and that is the rear three-quarter vision. The design and sloping roof line take away a lot of the glass and clear view that you have over your shoulder, especially to the left, and it kind of turns shoulder checks into more of a shoulder investigation. 
It does have a 360 degree parking camera and the mirrors automatically dip when you're in reverse, but changing lanes and trying to check your blind spot can take a little bit of extra time in this car. Aside from that, everything else about the car is quite pleasant. All of the controls fall easily at hand and the ergonomics feel good. My seating position is easy to achieve with this electrically adjustable seat. Mazda doesn't expect to sell lots and lots of MX-30s, probably because the CX-3 is immensely popular already, and the CX-30 provides an option for people looking for something a little more stylish. But the hybrid drivetrain in this is quite pleasant, even if it's a little more expensive. So am I gonna tell you to just buy a CX-30 instead? Well, not quite. I'm the kind of person who can see the appeal in a car that's a little more stylish for the sake of losing a little bit of practicality. I own an MX-5, and I think there are still buyers who can put up with things like a folding roof, or in this case, a little bit of a cramped rear seat, for the sake of a bit of extra style and fun. Plus, it definitely won't be as expensive as the EV version when it arrives. If you enjoyed this review, make sure you hit like, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment even, tell your mum, tell your dad, tell your brother, tell your sister, tell your dog, have a chat with your grocer,